the Leobeck Institute lecture series is organized jointly by the LBI Institute and German Historical Institute London. And my thanks go out to the German Historical Institute. It's always a pleasure to work with this institution. And my thanks go especially out to its director, Professor Christina von Hodenberg. This year's topic, acting Jewish between identity and Taya, is quite a political topic. And discussions about images and Jews, images of Jews and Judaism is always, are always quite difficult discussions. And as you know, probably if no, of you know it from their own experiences, these discussions are always also highly, very highly political. And today's topic, fashion, is a case in point. I'm therefore very happy to welcome tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Svenja Wedke. Svenja is a lecturer in European, in modern European history at the University of Leicester. Currently, she's a Marie, Marie Curie Fellow at the Abraham Harman Institute for Contemporary Jewelry at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Therefore, Svenja is joining us from Jerusalem. Erftov, Svenja. Her research interests are, I just mentioned her three big research interests, are firstly the Holocaust, with a focus on the Jewish experience in East Central Europe. Secondly, the legal history of modern Palestine in Israel, she's actually covering the 19th and 20th century, let's say from the Ottoman Empire up until now. And thirdly, this will also be the focus of her talk of tonight, visual culture and fashion history. Svenja published widely in all her fields. Let me give you some few examples. Let me start with her monograph, Tanz auf Messerschneide, Kriminalität und Recht in den Ghettos Warschau, Litzmannstadt und Vilna, published in 2015. An English version of this brilliant book will be published next year by the name, by the title, Dance on the Razor's Edge, Crime and Punishment in the Nazi Ghettos, published with the University of Toronto Press. This book is an award-winning award book. i just give you three examples. There's one more awards. First, Irma Rosenberg Prize, then the Immanuel Kant Research Prize, and the third prize, the Research Prize of the Consul General of the Polish Republic in Hamburg. Svenja has also published about fashion, which is her other main research interest. Let me give you one example. She edited together with Natalie Kegel um, a special issue of the International Journal of Fashion Studies. And the special issue is called Closing in Fashion in Historical Perspective, published in 2019. Currently, Svenja is working on a new project. And the title of the project is Closing Fashion and Nation Building in the Land of Israel. Today's lecture is part of this project and will maybe presenting also some of its first results. So Svenja will talk tonight about how to dress in Eretz Israel, clothing, fashion, and nation building from the 1880s to 1948. Svenja, over to you. Thank you very much. I'll just start by sharing. Okay, everyone sees my presentation before I start? Okay. So first of all, uh, good evening to everyone or good morning, depending on the location you are joining us from. And I would uh, like to start by thanking the Leo Beck Institute and the German Historical Institute for the very kind invitation to give this talk tonight. The title of my talk gives you already an idea 
that I'm trying to cover a lot in my project that will eventually uh, hopefully result in a monograph. Um, what I will do tonight is to give you an insight into the broad idea of my project that I'm currently pursuing on a Marie Curie Fellowship. But I'm only covering some aspects, so don't worry, I'm not trying to do everything tonight. So my broader project takes interest in the question to what extent different European migrant groups to Eretz Israel express their social, cultural and political belonging through dress. In this, I focus on the period from the 1880s when large-scale Jewish migration began until the foundation of the state, of the Israeli state in 1948. And I'm asking to what extent different groups were able to enforce their specific clothing ideals in the course of nation building. More broadly, I'm interested in the question how clothing becomes fashion or anti-fashion in the course of nation building in this region and to what extent a consensual mode of dress emerged. And I argue that such a focus allows us to add a more personal dimension to nation building and to the pre-state Jewish community and sheds light on the agencies of diverse migrant groups in this period. So please note that it is not a completed project. Uh, it is research in progress. And that said, I appreciate any feedback after the talk or any questions that may arise. I would like to start by showing you a photograph. This photograph was taken in 1908 or around 1908 in Enganim, one of the early Jewish settlements. The people pictured were part of the migration wave that took place between 1882 and 1914. About 70,000 Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe came to Ottoman ruled Palestine or as they saw it, to the land of Israel. And even without knowing much about this picture um, and the historical context, I think there are a few things when we're interested in dress that are specifically notable. Everyone in the picture is dressed differently. A woman lying on the ground in an elegant dress, one arm propped up to hold her hand, head. Um, some men wear the fez, the official headwear for men in the Ottoman Empire and bright Russian peasant shirts. Other men have bright scarves as kefirs on their head, as was common among Arab Bedouins. And some uh, Svenja, of Svenja, Svenja, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but we can't see your pictures. No. No, we can't. I mean, this is really strange. Okay, um, because it says that I'm sharing. Yes, you are. I mean, um, Luca has my presentation, so if there are any that makes any difference. Oh, now we are. Now? Here we are. This yeah. is should I start or should I just start from this slide? Is this your second slide? Yes. I mean, then I had just continue. I had the opening slide, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we didn't figure this out earlier. Okay, so let us go back to this photograph despite the technical challenges. Um, and uh, as I have already said, um, a few things are notable when looking at this picture if interested in dress. Um, people are dressed differently. Um, a woman is dressed in an elegant uh, bright dress uh, with quilling. Some of the wear, uh, men when wear fez, uh, the official headwear for men in the Ottoman Empire, and bright Russian peasant shirts. Other men have bright scarves as kefirs on their heads, as was common among Arab Bedouins. And some in the photograph are holding tools as if, as if they are complementing their outfit. I would just like to make two points at this stage. 
What we can see here is that dress was highly diverse. We see influences from both the countries of origin, as well as new ways of dressing, partly inspired by the local Arab population. But at this point, there was no sign of some kind of consensus um, what the Zionist way of dressing would be. And of course, we also have to consider that in times of scarcity, the possibility of um, choosing a specific kind of dress were limited. So I would like to continue by bringing to your attention some key terms. You may have noticed that also in the title of my talk, um, I'm mentioning clothing and fashion as two different words. So why should this matter to us and uh, of, of what benefit is this to my research project? If we turn to the work of scholars in fashion studies, um, and also in fashion history, we can find the following definition. By clothing designates the more comprehensive and technical facet of covering the human body, fashion is more closely related to social norms and aesthetics. So this definition is from Anna Tellman, under whose guidance I'm also pursuing my project here in Jerusalem. And um, there are similar definitions in fashion studies. And I think what is just uh, important to note here is that fashion is not an objective category. It is a definition depending on the context in which it is formulated. In addition to this, fashion is often associated with the existence of a so-called fashion system comprising design, production, advertising and consumption. And this has led to a strong focus on national developed fashion systems in the emerging field of fashion history. So in this regard, the case study that is uh, of interest to me is very different. But I want to argue, or this is my opinion, that this is what, it make, what makes it specifically interesting. So first of all, um, migration uh, to the region started, um, large scale migration started in the 1880s and continued um, be, um, up to and beyond the foundation of the Israeli state. The re resulting pre-state Jewish community was highly diverse with immigrants from Russia, the Soviet Union, Romania, Poland, Hungary, Austria, Czechoslovakia and Germany, thus encompassing a broad range of geographical and social backgrounds. They settled in a region with a large Arab, also Christian and Yemenite population that was in addition, frequently visited by travelers um, and pilgrims from Europe. In this, the European migrants' motivations were very diverse. They ranged from socioeconomic reasons, flight from anti-Semitic pogroms, Nazi persecution, to the advancement of political Zionist aims. And all this took place in a region with changing, occupying, authorities. And I forgot to mention that, of course, also the idea of the transformation of male and female identities was a core element in Zionism, which affected um, dress, as I will show later on. And all this correlated with the gradual development of a textile industry that was not yet marked by the characteristics of a developed fashion system. So it is against this background that I'm interested in the following questions. How did different groups of Europe European immigrants express their self-understanding, their belonging and their political aims through clothing? How was this linked to the countries of origin and their social background to the motivation to migrate to the region? And how could they enforce their clothing ideals? 
And in this, I'm specifically interested in the question how these new ideals were expressed through visual means. Okay, I think that at this point it has become clear that we cannot consider the history of dress in the land of Israel without looking at Jewish dress habits in Europe. I will make this very brief because this could be a topic of a whole lecture series, <laughs> but uh, there are some points that seem crucial to me when making my point later on what the significance of Zionist dress or the idea of Zionist dress was. So in pre-modern times, Jewish dress meant religious dress. On one hand, it was resulting from Jewish religious law and traditions regarding clothing and modesty. Now, on the other hand, non-Jewish authorities had imposed specific dress codes and symbols, as we all know, on the Jewish population to make them visible and mark them as different to prevent inter-religious relationships between Jews and Christians. With significant regional and national differences, the process of emancipation in Europe at the end of the 18th century also found its expression in the adaptation of dress codes and fashion trends popular among the non-Jewish population. And this development then led to the coexistence of modern and religious dress. It was in the second half of the 19th century and the end of it that Zionism emerged as a political movement that gave, um, gave up on the idea that full emancipation would be possible in the diaspora. Zionist leaders propagated migration to the land of Israel in the hope for a new national homeland. And the idea of becoming visible as Jewish was a key element in this. And I quote here, we did not become Zionists to have a colored rag wafting from our cloth. No, we pinned the yellow badge on the outside because our non-Jewish friends always thought it was hidden under our cloth. We don't want to wander around as lonely fools with a yellow badge on our coat. We want to create general respect for the yellow color. These words were formulated by Heinrich Jörg Steiner in the Zionist publication Die Welt in 1899. Of course, we have to under this, uh, understand this quote in a symbolic way, and it's just one example among many. And yet his words show that notions of visibility expressed through dress played a role in expressing feelings of belonging and identification with the Zionist project. The vision of becoming visible also led to the, to the use of Zionist symbols such as batches and needles attached to clothes and to the introduction of certain uniforms and outfits. Significant differences existed according to regions and the different Zionist groups that largely differed with regards to their political agendas. But the aim, they had one aim in common, the idea to become visible as Zionists and for many of them to create a dress code that was different from both religious and the dress of the non-Jewish population. And I just want to show you two examples. Here again, um, this could also be another lecture, but this is just one example um, of a group. Uh, this picture was taken in Crimea, um, and I have a collection of several hundreds of photographs from different groups uh, uh, in Eastern Europe. And um, I think we can all agree that there is a specific dress code here um, that characterizes this group that uh, kind of represents it as belonging together. And um, we have another example here. So we can see that there was not a common sense. And of course, it's very different what people shows in uh, studio portraits, but at least that there was this idea to cre create something new through items of dress that were chosen. This is also, uh, this is from Odessa, this picture. And in this, I mean, in both pictures, we see men 
um, an important role that also play the aim to create counter image to um, the anti-Semitic pro propaganda of the unmanly Jew and to create a new identity that symbolized this new strong uh, muscular uh, image. So to what extent did such traditions and the vis vision of becoming visible and forging a new way of dressing play out in the land of Israel after migration? Well, different views on appropriate dress led to conflicts and discussions that were basically an expression of the overarching question who the new ideal Jew was and what he should wear. In 1904, Hemda Ben Yehuda, the second wife of Elisa Ben Yehuda, the Zionist promoter of the modern Hebrew language, um, who had immigrated to Eretz Israel in 1881, explicitly mentioned the importance of dress and conflicts arriving from diff different ideals. Hemda, who liked to dress elegantly according to the latest Paris fashion, wrote in her own new fashion column in the newspaper Hashkafa. This is the first time during my lifetime that fashion will have been discussed in the Hebrew press. I write these lines with real fear and trepidation. Who knows whether they might not also ostracize me. With this, Hemda was referring to socialist Zionists that propagated a simple and functional way of dressing as an expression of their ideology, while rejecting any notion of a bourgeois European dress culture. However, there was also no consensus among socialist Zionist groups on how the ideal new Jew should dress. Although we have to, of course, have to differentiate between dress worn in everyday life and dress worn specifically for photographs taken in the studio, um, this portrait can give us a glimpse into the importance of experimenting with different ways of dressing, um, both influenced by uh, habits from the countries of origin and ideas about new dress in the new homeland. This photograph was taken by Avram Soskin, a strong supporter, was a photographer and a strong supporter of the Zionist labor movement in his photo studio around 1930. We can assume that the clothes had been provided by the photographer himself, as there are numerous similar photographs from his studio. The group shows members of Hashomer, a Jewish self-defense organization established by Boalei Zion that was responsible for protecting early Jewish settlements. What we can see here is on one hand references to the dress habits and practices um, of East, uh, like Eastern, Eastern European dress habits, like um, we have like the Cossack hat, um, and the Russian peasant dress, the, the shirts that we have seen before. Um, and on the other hand, the integration of ideas about how the Arab Bedouin population uh, was, was dressed. It was the aim to imitate those that had already been living in the region um, for a long time. And uh, just to note, as I said a lot about, or said something about the differences, but um, Hashomer was also known for integrating these uh, kind of uh, Arab elements in dress uh, in their everyday life when they were um, like uh, pursuing their duties. This was much uh, to the criticism of other socialist Zionists. Josef Aronovich, the editor of the newspaper of Papua Latzeir, complained in November 1912 that the moral state of the organization of Hashemer was totally unsatisfactory. While on one argument was that the members were guarding private property, the fact that they were dressing 
elegantly in Arab clothes was also explicitly mentioned. I quote, the ideal must be to protect the Jews and to strengthen and defend simplicity and not to approve at all to imitate the Arab men in dressing up in this costume. So with this, the writer labeled aesthetic notions of dress as incompatible with socialist ideology. And of course, we also have to consider here that indirectly such criticism was also referring to notions, anti-Semitic notions of being unmanly, a reproach that Zionist men wanted to avoid at all costs. And furthermore, we can see here how new ideas of Zionist dress um, as the appropriate expression of a new Hebrew culture related to discourses in the press. Discourses of fashion, aesthetics, and the rejection of it continued to play a role and led to conflicts um, in the pre-state Jewish community. The Zionist labor movement funded by Jewish immigrants, mostly of the second and third Aliyah from Eastern Europe, gained in strength and mandate Palestine in the 1930s. Idealizing the countryside as the place in which the transformation of the new Jewish men and women should take place, making use of the means of an emerging Zionist visual culture, they were able to anchor and perpetuate a new way of dressing as Zionist. The so-called khaki dress was functional and simple in style, with simple shorts and a shirt in blue or white, and sometimes contemplated by the cover timber or another kind of worker's hat um, that became later really a symbol or known as the national dress. And this dress has later been uh, labeled as anti-fashion by scholars as a conscious rejection prevailing um, bourgeois fashion trends. This development fell together and was enabled through the emergence of large and medium scale textile factories often established um, by immigrants from East Central Europe who brought with them their skills from the textile industry in Europe. It is thus no coincidence that these emerging factories were called Lodras and Mandate Palestine. And one prominent example is the example of the Atta factory established and run by the Meller family from Czechoslovakia in 1934. And this brand became known for producing kibbutz dress and worker clothes and thus as a symbol of the Zionist code. Although a parallel urban fashion sphere um, existed, very much oriented towards European fashion trends, it was this functional anti-fashion through visual means that became known as the symbol for the Zionist movement. And I told you I would talk more about conflicts and the different opinions. So um, the so-called fifth aliyah of German immigrants fleeing Nazi Germany in the 1930s challenged these newly established norms, <laughs> largely originating from urban middle class backgrounds, their clothing habits often uh, deferred and so did their ideals. They had fled from a country in which the Nazis since 1933 had attempted to make the alleged differences of the Jews visible again. First, they did so by defining and categorizing specific physical traits, and from 1941, as we all know, ultimately by ordering the Jews to attach the Star of David to their clothes. While the order is all too well known, it has hardly been interpreted as a brutal intervention into the very personal and intimate choice of what to wear to ultimately cover and protect the body. The 60,000 German Jews that fled Nazi Germany between 1933 and 1940 to British Mandate Palestine 
would then represent one quarter of the pre-state Jewish society. Forced to leave their country, their migration was not motivated primarily by political Zionist conviction. And even if it was, the functional Zionist dress codes that had emerged as part of the Zionist youth culture in Eastern Europe had not been adopted in the same way within the Zionist youth movements in Germany. Here it was a strong orientation towards visual appearance and dress codes of the German youth movements, and the exposure was more limited to specific events, mostly during leisure time. And I quote, the Yekis, the Yekis. As we came to the country, the kibbutzim were very important and the people went with a shirt and the yakas went with the cravat and the jacket. And it was said that yakka comes from jacket because they go with the jacket. The term yakka has been anchored as a common term used by early migrant groups to refer to the German Jews. Although the origin of the term is still contested, the meaning as presented by Janet Goldstein was interviewed is the most common explanation. Those who found it strange to wear jackets promoting more functional dress codes were able to label and mark those who did not as different and strange. And this is just anecdotal, but this is a photograph uh, from the um, collection of Otto Meyer from the Tef Museum. And on one of the photographs, uh, he added Jacke with jacket uh, in South irony. Um, so just to give you a visual impression, and of course, also that the Yakas themselves adopted this term uh, to when they're talking about themselves. With this ideolog uh, ideological significance of the countryside and the German Jews largely originating from the urban middle classes, it was specifically in the rural sphere and the kibbutzim that ideas expressed in dress clashed and that adjustment was difficult for many German Jews. Abraham Friedländer, who settled in a kibbutz after his arrival in Palestine, tells how it was a shock, especially for the German Jews, to hand over all their private item, dress, dress items to the common clothing room, as it was the practice in the kibbutzim. Then realizing that the secretary in the kibbutz took his leather jacket every time he was going to Tel Aviv made him furious. Similar reasons led Hilde Rutberg to leave the kibbutz. Without being asked explicitly in an interview, she mentions um, the difficulties with regards to dress. And I quote, what I simply did not want was that I was criticized for what I was wearing. Everyone had to work in the dining room, and there was criticized for what I was wearing, for the dress I was wearing. Others adjusted to these new dress codes for pragmatic reasons. Janet Goldstein bought khaki trousers because she knew that that would help her in getting a job at the university as a dishwasher. The experience of Fritz Wolf, a fellow German immigrant born in 1908, was different, at least when he arrived in Nacharia in Palestine in 1936 and received the following gift from his sister. And I quote, she gave me short khaki trousers and with this I was real. I received my uniform. How could I walk with long trousers in this heat here in the countryside? And this is how it came to my first important cloth metamorphosis. I wore long socks and short khaki trousers, an open neck shirt and I dumped the tights. I made the first transition, the transition to a state of tirelessness, to a peasant, to a proletarian. I was very proud and most of all, I felt relieved. And yet the new dress habits could not be easily learned. And that is where, um, yeah, people could also get it wrong as the experience of Gad Granach, another German Jewish immigrant shows. And I quote, I remember how I immediately went into town to buy some new clothes. 
under no circumstances did I want to be seen going around in my German winter clothes, from which everyone could immediately tell that I had just arrived. I bought some khaki pants, a khaki shirt and a safari helmet, but when I came back to the hostel, they all laughed. Afterwards, the safari helmet just sat on top of my closet in the kibbutz. So the question arises, what was decisive in the different approaches between adjustment and rejection to the new way of dressing and the norms and values that came with it? Although more research needs to be conducted to confirm this, a number of aspects could be considered. First, political feelings of belonging and the extent to which the German Jews were identifying with the, with, with the Zionist ideology. Second, the degree to which immigrants had to give up their previous life, including their profession, um, and were forced to reinvent themselves. And of course, gender played a role. The new ideal of the Jew settler was the strong male, physically working pioneer. This image, um, as, we, as I've already mentioned, was invented as a counter image. Um, and on the other hand, for, for women, role models were much more contradictive and thus not easy, easily available as an alternative identity to strive for. And finally, certainly age and belonging to a certain generation was decisive in these processes. In the cities, the situation was somehow different. Here, a fashion sphere emerged that was oriented towards trends in Europe. Many immigrants from Central Europe made use of their skills in opening tailor shops, fashion boutiques, and textile factories. In the urban sphere, the dress ideas of the Zionist movement were less present and allowed the German Jewish immigrants to express their concerns more explicitly. Hilde Hoffmann, born in and living in Tel Aviv, com no, <laughs> living in Tel Aviv, commented, I quote, it is totally inappropriate when you see visitors of the opera in casual dress or that men do not wear suits at all. The Sabra did not dress up. We as Yakas find it appalling that you go out and that you don't dress up. And sometimes such critical voices also went hand in hand with long prevailing resentment of the German Jews towards Eastern European Jews. While many of the German Jews had been looking down on the Eastern European Jews as backward and uncultured, the latter were now the ones who were able to enforce their norms and, ide and ideals also in dress. Eliezer Elat made fun of the Russian speaking functionaries, describing a meeting with Berkat Snelson and Levi Eshko. And I quote, they came exactly like the Russians with such stockings and then with such a white blouse and such a colorful cord, a drawstring. So to conclude, a focus on dress in historical perspective can be a fruitful approach to researching social, geographical and political belonging. As notions of what is seen aesthetic, appropriate and fashionable always depend on the social and cultural context within which they are formulating. So such a focus is specifically interesting in the context of migration, leading to the confrontation of often contradictive ideals and practices. In this, we could see that there were certain conflicts that arose repeatedly, such as the matter of aesthetics versus functionality, fashion and anti-fashion, individualism versus community, and the hierarchies between the urban and the rural sphere, and production and consumerism. It furthermore touches upon key questions of integration and exclusion and the vision of a new national identity. So I've tried to show that it's specifically a setting in which national dress ideals are not yet anchored and in which a national textile and fashion industry is not developed that allows to shed light on differing opinions and conflicts um, in the process of nation building. And it should have become clear that what to wear 
uh, was a question that did not only matter to women, but also and importantly to men. In a society in which the image of the new Jewish man was so crucial for the development of the Zionist vision, but very different from the experience in the countries of origin, the importance of dress and reinventing themselves um, was key. Thank you. Thank you very much, Svenja, for this extremely illustrative lecture about question of belongings and the role of fashions, role of fashion plays um, in this undertaking. Now I would like to open um, your talk to the audience, our audience. Um, first, I would like to explain to the audience how can you ask questions. It's very easy. If you would like to ask a question, please write your name, just your name um, in the chat box and press return so that we can find you on screen and unmute you. You see the chat function in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, I have already two questions. So the first one goes to Lawrence Joffe and then to Helen. So please, Lawrence Joffe, your question, please. Okay. And Svenja, can you um, stop screen sharing, please? So yes, I can uh -huh. see yeah. our audience. Oh, sorry. I'm going to start my video. <laughs> I'm not very good at this. Here we go. So Lawrence, you have the first yes. question. Ah, thank you very much. And thank you for the presentation. I, I find it very interesting and charming photographs. Um, my question is not, well, my question is, I once heard that high society ladies from Tel Aviv used to go shopping for the latest fashions in Beirut uh, in the days when, when, the, when the borders were, were not like they are today, uh, you know, from one mandate to another, from the British one. Um, and presumably they went from App, uh, Allenby Street there to, to, to the other Allenby Street. Um, I just wondered if you could say anything about this uh, phenomenon, whether it's actually true or just part of uh, urban or double urban myths, if you like, and um, maybe why perhaps they were combining a holiday to Lebanon as, as an exciting diversion and putting some fashion in, or did they simply not have any high quality fashion shops like that in, in Tel Aviv itself. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this question. Um, yeah, this is indeed very in a very interesting aspect and I also read about it. Um, so for example, I did not go into detail, but in this fashion column of uh, Randa Ben Yehuda, she also kind of talks about where to get the uh, fabric. And of course, it's on one hand very much informed by European fashion trends. And she has like uh, journalists reporting from Berlin. But there is also mentioning, for instance, like uh, that fabrics could be uh, bought in Egypt. This is something I came across, um, Alexandria. And um, so I I'm not surprised. And of course, I assume that uh, this was both exciting and a reasonable thing to do and uh, yeah, possible at the time. So absolutely another trans transnational dimension to this. Okay. Helen had a question too. Can we unmute Helen, please? I, I mute, I, I um, <laughs> just muted my, my microphone myself. Perfect. Thank you. Um, hello to everyone and thank you one. Thank you for this very interesting talk. I'm very much looking forward to, to hopefully soon hearing and, and reading more about um, the subject you're working on. Um, okay, um, I think at another, in another um, context, I already mentioned the um, autobiographical uh, notes by Rachel Yanaid Ben Svi. Um, mm -hmm. She's also writing about um, her, um, what she's wearing when, um, when um, exploring the countryside and so on um, after she came to, to Palestine, I think in 1906. And she's um, She's um, she moved in the um, context of um, Hashomer 
actually. So, um, but my question really is, um, coming to, to the German and German speaking immigrants, um, I don't know if you've seen this very interesting um, documentary um, from, I think, 2010, 2011, Hadira. Mm -hmm. No, oh, I haven't. I know of this, it. I should. <laughs> because it begins with this um, nightmare, if you're interested in, in historical clothes, where they take all the clothes of the grandmother of the... the um, uh, of, of the one who, who made this documentary, of which she brought from Berlin in the 30s and, and put it into garbage sacks and throw it just out of the window. And um, this inspired my question. Um, we know that there's a very, very, very uh, impressive collection of clothes at the Israel Museum. And I know that your mon interest lies more in this kind of visual aspects of the questions. But do you know if there, are, there is a collection of clothes which um, German speaking uh, European immigrants brought to Palestine? And is there, I don't know, is, is, is there some research going on about it? I mean, apart from yours, I mean, what, was it considered interest at all if there is a collection so far. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Helen. Um, well, I would doubt that there is an official collection because I, I mean, I'm, I, because um, from what I can see with these collections of material culture and that there are a few and the Schenkar uh, College, for instance, has one and uh, the Israel Museum has one that here, and this is kind of uh, yeah, linked to my, to, to my broader interest, that of course you have only a very specific representation of what is considered um, kind of valuable when thinking about national dress. And what I saw, for instance, at the at Schenkar is that they keep, I mean, of course, it's interesting, fair enough, but they, they keep like on one hand, like the first Israeli fashion brands, like costumes, and then they keep like Atta clothes and so on that became kind of yeah, the symbol. So um, I doubt that there is a, um, something like that, but I, I, I'm, I'm very sure and I know of a few examples where these private collections of course exist. And I mean, I'm talking because when, when does something become a collection? But just from my own experience, I talked to uh, a Yekke um, like she came as a child, but what she showed me, I was I was living with her for a while. <laughs> like she's a very, <laughs> very old, but very interesting to talk to. And what she showed me immediately when I talked about my project, she said, yeah, I still have all the clothes from my mother because the quality is so good and I would never throw this away. And I mean, it just shows you how much, it, and, and she also said, yes, yeah, it's, it's memory and uh, you wouldn't find it here. So I think there is something to, and I, I had planned and then came Corona to conduct more interviews on that specifically on this notion of like the personal uh, significance for people and belonging and uh, origin and memory. But yeah, so just an anecdote, but uh, to answer your question. Kinga, you have a question? Um, yes, yeah, I do. Thank you very much, Svenja, for your really exciting talk. Um, I was pondering a bit about the very interesting um, images that you showed from, from I think, um, posters and um, that article in the paper that you mentioned. And how far was this discourse that you're talking about medialized? So was it very dominant in the press talking about attire? Or was it something that happened more in these private confrontations that you illustrated so so nicely in, in the quotes that you pulled from the sources. Yeah, thank you. And this goes to the core of one of my <laughs> biggest problems. Uh, no, it's, I mean, one thing I have done, and I also had the help of a, a very talented research student um, who helped me going through the, the pre-state press, because I was wondering like where these discourses take place and how they take place. So this fashion column is 
highly interesting, but in like, if you consider the amount of newspapers that were published, it only is a very small part of what was discussed. So, um, but, but I, I am very, I mean, this fashion column is, is really, it's really interesting because she talks a lot about um, kind of how should women dress and why and what and what is not appropriate and what could be commented on so you get an idea that there is this notion of we have to change something and nonetheless we want to kind of provide uh like advice and like this need for uh um yeah kind of dressing up fashion fashion uh, in a fashionable way and there's also much talk about imported fashion magazines from europe so this played a role what I looked at, on the other hand, as I'm interested in this, okay, what, so what about this kind of anti-fashion or the functional way of dressing? I looked into kind of reports. I mean, of course, visual culture played an important role, but then I was also interested in finding um, articles where you have kind of this like when is clothing charged with meaning with political meaning saying oh yeah and he was wearing this or the whole group was wearing a certain type of uniform and so on and you don't find uh, you can't find a lot because if it's not supposed to, to matter then it's not made explicit but interestingly you can find something where it's about the power parade and they wear this and that and this is now the color and blue is now the color so it's not what you expect when you think about fashion but it's what you get when you think about how clothing is charged with political meaning and how this kind of identity is created through that. But it's kind of different spheres in which this takes place. Thank you. Please use um, the chat box um, to raise your question and just putting your name so I can see you and give you a chance to ask questions. I would like to come in now. I, I have two questions actually. One is about this picture of the Hashomer Hatzair from 1913, I think, the Cossacks. You know, when you look at East European memory, the Cossacks don't have such a good reputation, right? So how come that no. Cossack that the Eastern European um, Zionists, Hashomer Hatzair, try to integrate a Cossack tradition into kind of building up the new Jew. That's my first question. The second question is, quite rightly, you made it way clear there's kind of a big gap between, say, functional and non-functional fashion between, let's say, Polish Jews focusing on agrarian society and say, other Jews working within an urban society, right? And as an example of urban society, you brought up Tel Aviv, which makes sense. But when you speak about urban society in, let's say, in the 1920s, 1930s, actually until the 1950s, 60s even, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem had very different reputations. Jerusalem was seen as this is the thing, while Tel Aviv was also always seen as mm, low culture. This has changed in the last 10 years, but at least until the 1960s, Jerusalem was the top and Tel Aviv was not really the top. Mm -hmm. Do we have these kind of differentiations um, which are linked to moral values also when, you, when we look at fashion in urban society in Israel between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, for both questions, uh, yeah, first of all, the, the Cossacks in, in the Hashanah Tzair, and uh, not at the uh, Shomer picture. <laughs> um, yeah, of course, this is something um, that I also noticed, and where you, you put it uh, like in a very uh, light version, but of course, uh, Cossacks were like um, the 
uh, well, were often um, part of anti-Semitic mm -hmm. uh, violence. So, of course, there's the question, how come that this all of a sudden becomes then an element that is incorporated here? And um, I mean, the only explanation, and it's not only in this picture, it comes up in several pictures, of course, they may have been taken around the same time, but I would think that there is something to kind of specifically kind of appropriate this kind of image and integrate it into like this way of being or experimenting or dressing up and um, to specifically develop a counter image mm -hmm. uh, it, like yeah in, in in this context I mean this is the only explanation I can get and of course in addition to that um, well Jewish self-defense organization and I found other references to certain elements that they refer to when thinking about Cossacks and also like their way of uh, self-organization. Um, so there may also be an element to that, but I, I assume it's really a way of kind of creating a counter image by appropriating certain elements from, uh, from, from their way of dressing. Um, and the urban spheres question i mean yeah it's really um interesting and i have to admit that most of my well the research that i did on the urban fashion sphere was mostly uh on tel aviv as it was uh, just more accessible at the time um and i have not come specifically across comparisons but it's a very good point to bear in mind for 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 the future <laughs> to look into that it's a good point more questions yes tabea please Hello, thank you so, so much, Svenja. Um, I've enjoyed this very much. Um, I have many questions and I'm sure I will bombard you in the future, but um, one of the questions I have is around time and timing and the passage of time, because I think you've, you've ended or your research period is ending around the time of the foundation of the State of Israel. And so my question would be whether you, whether you would say that with that establishment, the necessity for national dress sort of fades over time because there is more, more certainty in the state or whether you think that is perhaps um, a sign of the 20th century as such and the way fashion maybe signifies different things in different time periods universally. Um, and even, you know, now that you're living there at the moment, what are your observations about national dress in Israel now? Mm, thank you. Yeah, um, very good questions. And to answer the first, um, I mean, it was uh, partly out of pragmatic reasons that I said this time period. I think otherwise I would not have got funding for this. <laughs> but to give you an outlook, I mean, no, it doesn't. Of course, it doesn't stop. And what is in, I mean, not this is partly how I came to my project because Anna Tellman, who is uh, kind of hosting my fellowship, wrote a book on uh, fashion in the 1950s. And you specific, it's specifically then that you have this kind of um, clash of anti fashion and fashion, and that with like the new, like, national press and there are all of a sudden women's magazines and um there are uh, yeah other visual means so it doesn't stop and you have on one hand this kind of european oriented urban fashion sphere and on the other hand you have all these images from the kibbutzim from uh, all the uh, relevant um groups involved to and it and it becomes in a way visually much much stronger um, and then in the 60s and later on, and this is maybe then linked to your question about what about today, um, you have these first Israeli like masquite, like uh, fashion brands that 
consider themselves being like more kind of high class fashion, but with an Israeli touch to it. And I mean, no, so what, what makes it Israeli then? What makes it, uh, that, that's the big question, but um, they, they want to be different from the European fashion brands and they uh, kind of find a narrative. And of course, also it's reflected in design and material and color and so on. Um, and talking about today, I mean, I think the big change then came with globalization and Amer Americanization, that there is a shift that is quite similar to other regions. But I did speak to uh, a fashion scholar who is very much interested in what is kind of happening right now. And she said it is still very different from many other regions. And of course, you only have to think about still the, and I didn't say much about it in my talk, so it's not so much my focus, but when I walk down Jaffa Street, and all the, those catering orthodox fashion taste and dress, and this matters so much, and I think it's very unique. And of course, you have big chains that you have in other um, countries or globally, but it, I think what you have is you have these very different spheres uh, that are kind of, um, yeah, uh, matching different needs and tastes. Uh, so it is something interesting. Helene has another question. Yes, hello. <laughs> another question. First, in addition to what Svenja said about um, about the Hashomer pictures, because I actually happened to to have written together with Martin Tremel a short essay on 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 these um, Soskin. Um, mm -hmm. pictures of, of the Shomrim and I think it's all about self-defense and you have to mm -hmm. pay um, um, attention to the I call it accessories and the difference you have between the Hashomer pictures and those pictures of the of the farmers of the kibbutzim because they carry this kind of um, um, the, the, the farming tools and the Shomrim have the weapons. And, um, and it's very Im important. Also, there are other pictures, kind of outdoor pictures of Soskin, where you have um, mounted Shomrim. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it, it's very much to show we are the, the, the um, strong uh, Jews who do self-defense. So um, this is one um, addition to what Svenja said. And, um, and also, when there is there's Tel Aviv in Jerusalem, and there's Haifa, and oh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. with, um, with yeah. a very strong German community in the 30s. So I don't yeah. know if you is there a part of your work where you paid special attention to Haifa? Yeah, no, actually, this was um, one of my ideas to look more into the urban fashion sphere in Haifa as well and also go to Nacharia because of mm -hmm. that's where the Jews are. So there are many uh, kind of avenues to, to go to, but uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, no, thank you. Very good point. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, I have another question I would like to continue with comments from Helen, that's one, I have two questions are actually, one goes really back to the Shomrim. Um, we have weaponry, correct? We do have the Cossacks, <laughs> correct? And I think your explanation regarding the Cossacks makes sense. But what you also have is you mentioned these Arab or Bedouin fashion mm -hmm. elements, I'm not quite sure it's Bedouin or Arab. So it's kind of go local issue there, but also the connections, the relationships between the Shomrim and the local population was not also so easy. So how do you explain the Bedouins and the question of Orientalism comes into that? That's my first question. And the other question is, we talked a lot about urban society and how complex urban society was. I would like now to go back um, to what we may call agrarian society, you know, the epitome of Zionism, kibbutz, in those times. And here my question is, 
gender. You know, how was gender constructed with the tool of fashion? In other words, how does functional translate into gender? That's my second question. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so you mentioned Orientalism, and mm -hmm. of course we have to, I think, bear in mind that uh, these were not very, I mean, as much as it was a theme in Europe in general, it mattered very much in the imagination of like the land of Israel, what it would be like living there. So I do think that, and of course, uh, I hope I made that clear enough, it was not the question of how the Bedouins really dressed, but what mm -hmm. people imagined how they were dressing. So mm -hmm. I think this kind of identification and this, this kind of aim to to reinvent themselves and at the same time finding a way to feel close to traditional history and the requirements that came with like uh, starting a new life um, played played a role in uh, yeah kind of choosing these elements and yeah you have it uh, I mean and what is interesting I didn't mention it now but you may have noticed the picture I showed from uh, um, Crimea um uh, it was actually you had also these um kind of scarves worn in a similar way to those that we then later uh, can see in in the land of israel so mm -hmm. what i'm asking myself if, there, if there's also kind of a if, if this imagination and the visual representations that are were, uh, circulated in a way then also influenced uh kind of um, this adaptation on a more transnational level, but um, for sure uh, the imagination of the um, Bedouin uh, was uh, key here. And functionality and gender, yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, of course, it's very, um, there is this, how is it called? Like, yeah, um, this book by Julie Grimm Eisen, uh, that you might know, she wrote about uh, the kind of early um, yeah, years of the Israeli state and she wrote specifically about this conflict between on one hand also trying to invent the kind of Zionist pioneer as a woman and on the other hand this always conflicting with uh, traditional expectations on what uh, a woman should wear and so on. And of course, also maybe an interest and in me, but I do think that this, like at the core of this Zionist vision was to reinvent the strong muscular male do first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And that this idea of creating a woman that would also fit these new expectations was in a way this expectations to uh, yeah kind of have this uh, male element also expressed in the way women dress although they will love to have skirts but I think functionality here is very much understood as also functionality as male while mm -hmm. aesthetics and kind of the mm -hmm. luxury of thinking about fashion is seen as a um, as a female element, which, by the way, I mean, in the urban fashion spheres, like there was also, I mean, it mattered a lot to men and the question, like how, how to dress elegantly for men also mm -hmm. mattered a lot in, in this urban sphere. Thank you. If there are no other questions. Oh, Helen has one last question. <laughs> Can we unmute Helen, please? Helen, your turn. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm sorry that I'm kind of, in German, I would say, Gretchen in. I Gretchen I, I, I hinein all the time into the, the discussion. But um, I would really, be, because it's, it's so very interesting, this book I mentioned by uh, Rachel mm -hmm. Yanaid Ben Svi is so very interesting because it also, she, she, um, 
uh, mentions again and again the ambivalence of the relationship to um, to the Arab um, mm -hmm. um, to the Arab uh, uh, population um, uh, and uh, and also um, this kind of uh, I don't know if you can call it cross dressing but um, mm -hmm. she also mentions that she she goes out um, in herself in kind of Bedouin dress and um, mm -hmm. and this is kind of a male dress um, compared to Euro her European dress and that she sometimes um, uh, her, her landlady also is very um, how, how can I say she doesn't like it very much but she also mentions the point of because it's um, because it's more practical to go, to go out and also it's give, it gives her kind of freedom um, so this is I mean of course you have to consider that is uh, she she wrote it years later and it's kind of um, um, she she probably brushes some things away mm -hmm. but it's a very 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 um, interesting source for this early time and especially for this kind of thinking of the people um, around Tashomer and also mm -hmm. she's there was this kind of ideal idealization of the Bedouin way of life, this kind of freedom, the the riding, the taking um, taking the arms, and also um, it goes so far. She mentions that she she visits with um, someone else, an archivist, and they are looking for sources about uh, a Jewish Bedouin tribe. So they really they're really trying to co connect to this ancient. To, to ancient Jews um, and and what survived of them and um, so yeah this is this explains really really a lot yeah thank you Svenja you want to add something no I'm just very grateful for this input and the advice to look at that book okay then there are no questions anymore. Okay, then I would like to bring the official part of this Zoom event to an end. So my thanks go out to Svenja for this super interesting um, presentation. And my thanks go also out to my audience for gretching in <laughs> <laughs> and asking super interesting questions, even about cross-dressing in a very new innovative way. That's really great, this topic. I also say thank you to my assistants who made tonight's online event possible. And I hope to see you again next year. We start next year our new lecture series in the next spring 2021, precisely on February the 11th. Next year's topic is conceptions of Heimat in Jewish visual history and culture. So it's again, something very visual. I have seen a lot of new um, faces today. If you want to be on our um, email list, don't hesitate to get in touch with us and leave your email address so we will be happy to inform you of everything which we'll do in the near future. At the time, unfortunately, Zoom only, but we hope maybe the situation might change in the next summer. Thank you so much and please stay safe. Good night.